Okay, we're recording. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome back after our short spring break. Um, thanks, you, thanks to all of you for coming. We're very happy to have Wade Bloomquist from Georgia Tech today to tell us all about stated skein modules and algebras. Take it away. Uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, join, at least virtually. It's a little bit easier than attending in person. And I wanted to thank the organizers for having me. Um, so I think even before going to any additional slides, uh, I want to highlight the fact that uh, right, it is a learning seminar. So I really want to emphasize that if people want to stop and ask questions or anything in the talk, that's wonderful. And if we don't get as far as we might otherwise, that's perfectly fine. It's a learning seminar. And I don't know if that's how things are kind of typically done, but that's how we'll, we'll do things today. Good. So a quick question. Is there a link to the uh, slides? Is there a link to the slides? Yeah, um, if you want to scroll back and forth independently of you. That's a fantastic question. And I should have done something <laughs> like that. I hadn't thought of that, but um, so no is the shortest answer. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. But maybe I can make, maybe I can set something up in the five minute or the, the break thing at the, at the half point, because uh, it should be easy. But, okay. So if we, get started. So this is a slide. This is a big picture kind of overview of the entire talk. We're going to look at some diagrammatic constructions related to topology of surfaces and three manifolds. And we want to see how there's kind of an overlap with uh, some kind of uh, with quantum groups and some structures there. And we really want to emphasize some homomorphisms that arise that give a lot of structure to these constructions. Now, at the moment, I do want to emphasize that, uh, as well here that there isn't necessarily much categorification in this talk. This is the categorification seminar, but this might be a talk that you take more along the lines of, here are some things that it would be interesting to categorify, or here, uh, here's something that is just categorification adjacent for the moment. I, I'm not particularly an expert in categorification itself. So that could be where you join the picture if you're in this seminar. But uh, kind of going through a brief little outline of what we'll be talking about today, we have some preliminary topology, we have some preliminary algebra, then we have the stated skein module and stated skein algebra, and then at least the one uh, homomorphism that it would be great if we can get to and talk about is the chebyshev frobenius homomorphism. Then of course there are properties and observations, but once we're down here, um, this is probably far too optimistic that we will actually get to that point in the talk. But maybe questions can be addressed with slides and that's always a nice thing to do. Okay, so getting started with some preliminary topology, we have the ordinary or Kaufman bracket skein module. And this definition is uh, like right off the bat, you might see, okay, there's a lot of words going on here. We have a quotient of this free module generated by all these kinds of things. Really in your head, it's going to be best to think of this as links in a three manifold subject to these two relations. These are our skein relations and we're just putting links into a three manifold subject to these relations. So we have linear combinations of links. That's what we mean by a free module spanned by the isotopy classes. And we're taking a quotient, which is giving us relations between the links or the like linear combination of links in that three manifold. Now, when we say framed, that can mean a lot of different things. You could put a normal vector field along things, but for us in our pictures, this is just going to take the blackboard framing convention. So if you want, you could thicken things into a little annulus instead of an actual just link, but we're gonna take a normal vector sticking straight out of, or I guess straight out of the screen. It's no longer a blackboard, um, but you can think of that as being thickened in the page as well. So this kind of strand, say right there, why not? is secretly a little annulus. And that's perfectly a fine thing to do. Now, this relation is happening inside of a ball, right? You might say, okay, this is happening, okay, the link is in a three manifold, but we're applying relations in a ball. 
And what we mean by that is inside of this ball, if we have a crossing, we can resolve it in this way into this linear combination. But outside of the ball, everything out here is remaining exactly the same in the two pictures. So on the left-hand side or on both pieces, both terms of the right-hand side, outside of the ball, everything remains the same. So we really only have two relations for the initial Kaufman brackets gain module. We have resolving a crossing and what we could call popping a bubble. And this might differ ever so slightly from the normalization that you're used to, but that's fine too. So, okay. Are there any questions here? This is kind of the most classical object that we're building off of and heading towards something different. Okay. So now we had the skein module of a three manifold. It's great to talk about the skein module of S3 as a great three manifold to start with, because in this case, everything is just going to resolve down to some Laurent polynomial in Q times the empty diagram. So we have an example of a link. It's a great Hopf link, it's fine. And we can see how applying the um, crossing resolution relation twice in little balls inside of there, give us some Laurent polynomial. I didn't take the time to simplify it. It's not really worth the effort, but it's some Laurent polynomial by applying these relations times the empty diagram. And for S3, every link is going to resolve down using these two relations to some Laurent polynomial times the empty diagram. But this isn't always the case, right? So this gives us the Kaufman bracket of a link kind of traditionally. But if we go to other three manifolds, we see that we've generalized away from just the Kaufman bracket of a link two more interesting phenomena, right? Here's a genus one handle body. So this is a solid surface here. And this is a, not a very interesting equality. This is maybe like a reflexive equality, but there's no relation we can apply, right? There's no crossings to resolve and there's no bubbles to pop. So there's nothing else to resolve down. We're not getting down to some Laurent polynomial times the empty diagram because we don't have any way of reducing something like this, for example. Hey, wait, I have a question. Fantastic, yeah. Um, thanks. So in S3, we are inherently saying we're going to project down to maybe an S2. Well, you know, we're doing some sort of canonical way of looking at this picture. In my mind, a skein algebra is always sort of viewed on a two-dimensional surface, how do you choose a canonical way to project for like some closed but um, with boundaries three manifold? So that's a fantastic question and it's going to kind of come up and I think what you're kind of observing is that if you have a surface cross an interval, there's of course additional structure, right? So if you have a surface cross an interval, you are able to project down onto the surface and kind of work there. Where in a three manifold, you're kind of just taking balls where sure there is a ball there that you can look at and you can resolve the crossing inside of that disk cross an interval if you wanted to. But I mean, in general, you're not just kind of projecting down onto some kind of like, canonical surface or anything like that. And we'll see in a second that that's really the difference between the skein module of a three manifold versus a skein algebra of a surface. There's just, there's of course much more, there's additional structure. So we can say more about what kind of algebraic object that is specifically because we can project onto something. Did that I see, that clears a lot of things up. Yeah, so you're saying that in like the, the three manifold case, the ball, um, you know, taking two opposite sides of a tetrahedron or edges, you're not preferring anything, but in the algebra side, you have a preference. Yeah, right, so uh, phrase. Okay and this is, I guess, coming up, so we might as well go to that slide. Um, so when we have a surface cross an interval, suddenly you can project down on whatever link you had inside of that three manifold to say, uh, if our interval is negative one to one, we can project onto the zero surface, that surface cross zero. 
or circuit surface cross one half if you prefer, that's fine too. But then there's a well-defined multiplication because there's a notion of vertically over and under, you can stack one link diagram on the surface on top of another. And here's an example on the torus where you have the meridian times the longitude. And I'm of course being intentionally ambiguous as to if you're multiplying on the left or multiplying on the right, because it's just a convention. It doesn't particularly matter on which one goes over that. It's intimately, it's very much related to the exchange between Q and Q inverse, but that's not particularly important. But what was kind of just pointed out, I think uh, by Melissa or something that's, that's really worth mentioning is that in an arbitrary skein module of a three manifold, you don't have this multiplication. There's no notion of vertical stacking. So it's not an algebra, it is just a module. You're just looking at this quotient of the free module it's like a vector space if you want to work over, um, say, the complex uh, complex numbers or something like that. But there's additional structure when we have the specific three manifold of surface cross an interval. Now we can stack, we can resolve, everything is great. And something to point out is that in this case, this is, uh, we can actually say more, and if, just to give a time frame as well, because I think that's usually helpful on when these kind of things came up. But in 1999, Yosef uh, Shetitsky showed that there is a nice basis of kind of simple diagrams of multi-curves. And simple diagrams and of multi-curves, what, what we really mean by that is just no, there's no crossings, and it's just kind of a, it, we're not actually giving a precise definition of simple, but you can think of it as crossing list diagrams on the surface for the moment. So that really is just studying multi-curves on the surface then, because if you have, yeah, uh, just closed links that are projected down onto it, well, you're looking at multi-curves. Okay, did that kind of clear things up a little bit? And, okay. So now this was an algebra, but we need to talk about some algebra. So this is, uh, I'm, I call it the required quantum group definition, because if you're going to talk about quantum groups, you should include a definition of UQSL2. But I was actually thinking quite a bit about like when, when constructing this, if you don't already know what UQSL2 is, this slide provides you no information. I think that's that's fair to say. You're not really gaining anything by me saying, oh, it's the Hopf algebra generated by this, this, as this co-product and as this antipode. So it's included for a reason because, I mean, we're talking about quantum groups and this is your, if you are already familiar with quantum groups, this is your safety blanket. This is what you know and this is what you hope to grasp onto, probably. Um, I guess I shouldn't speak for everyone, but again, if you don't already know what this is, it's not particularly helpful. But we can use it to outline a couple of things about what we mean by a Hopf algebra, just quickly. So a Hopf algebra, first of all, it's an algebra. So we have some generators and relations, but on top of that kind of generators and relations, we also have a co-product, which we can see sends us from the algebra to the algebra tensor itself. And we have an antipode from the algebra to itself. But again, if you don't know what this is already, this isn't particularly helpful. So we're, oh, I'm open to questions. Um, so the question was asked, is there a typo or is Q to the one half really needed? Q to the one half is what we want specifically because uh, going forward, we'll use Q to the one half. So we want okay. a choice of a square root of, we want a choice of a square root of Q. It, is, it looks like you've already squared Q by writing these relations in this way. Yeah, see K but, but is- Q to the fourth right there, Matt. So it's, it's okay. So it's the square of what's in the denominator. So he's, it looks like it works. I just, I was wondering if this Q is already the square root of Q. So there's a, 
there's an eighth power floating around, right? That's kind you of the really, question. You really do need the eighth power. Okay, interesting. That's, a, that's the spread that we're looking for, yeah. We're, we're looking okay. for the spread of yeah, eight. Great, thank you. Oh, so we do have a question from the chat and say that in this theorem, is there a connection with Hegard floor homology of surfaces? I think that it would be irresponsible to say no, but I'm not particularly confident of any exact connection. But of course, everything in this field is probably connected in some very deep way. So I don't think I can describe a connection between Hegard floor homology and these skein algebras directly, but I'm, there certainly uh, is likely some connection at some, at some stage of that. Yeah, okay. So luckily, this is not the quantum group we will focus on. And I only say luckily because I just said that if you don't know what this quantum group is, then it's not going to be useful to see that slide. So it's worth having there in case you do know what it is, but that's not exactly what we're going to focus on. Okay. So this is not a quantum group, but this is a great coordinate algebra on an algebraic group. So SL2 is kind of my favorite example of something like an algebraic group. So this is a group, of course, but there's also nice structure. We have that it's a top of, so you can say it's a manifold if you want. We don't have to say uh, algebraic group, variety, manifold, what's the difference? Um, but, so this is a great group and our coordinates or the coordinate algebra of this is just picking out the entries of our matrix. So the function A is going to be what takes the one one entry of the matrix and sends it to whatever we had in the one one entry of the matrix. So we can kind of identify the entries of that matrix with those functions. And you see nice things like AD minus BC being one. Well, that's just the determinant is one. These are two by two matrix matrices. This is a fantastic algebraic group. And actually, we're not too focused on the fact that it's an algebraic group. We're really looking at the coordinate algebra or the coordinate ring, if you prefer, of this algebraic group. Okay. Are there any questions about what we mean here on this slide? Picking out the coordinates of a matrix, something like this. This is maybe related to algebra you've thought of before, but it might not be exactly something that you've spent a lot of time with. So we had our favorite coordinate algebra here. So our favorite quantum coordinate algebra. So this is a, a deformation of that. We might lose the underlying algebraic group, but it's still a coordinate ring of what that would be. It, it's a silly way to describe something, but that's kind of how we think about it. But more importantly, this is just, it's following the same kinds of relations that we had above, where we didn't necessarily even have to specify that they commuted because we were just looking at the, um, looking at like polynomial and commuting variables subject to certain relations. But here, we don't necessarily have that these generators of this new algebra commute. Instead, we have that these Q commute. And the way that I kind of wrote these is uh, just to keep track as a nice little thing to have in mind, is that if you alphabetize them, you'll pick up a Q, right? So B, A, Q, A, B, because A, B is an alphabetical order. And this right here could be what you call the quantum determinant relation. So it's a little bit off. It's no longer AD minus BC equals one. Now you have these factors of Q involved. So if we set Q equal to one, okay, we have all of these commuting variables and this relation reduces down to the determinant. So that's a great place to be. We have this new algebra. 
and it's related to our favorite coordinate algebra. But the question is, how is this related to UQSL2? If you're talking about quantum groups, you better relate back to UQSL2 because that's everyone's comfort zone. And what we have here is a nice Hopf pairing between these two Hopf algebras or quantum groups. And specifically, I didn't actually describe the co-product or antipode on the previous slide, but it's there. That's okay. It's just swept under the rug a little bit because we're going to try to give a better description of that in a little bit. But this Hopf pairing doesn't mean a whole lot to you if you didn't already know what UQSL2 was and if you didn't already know what OQSL2 is. But it's, it's very much related to kind of the uh, representation theory of, say, like UQSL2. If you're looking at this pairing as coming from the defining representation of UQSL2, something like that. But this is kind of just here for the moment. It's okay if there isn't much content in your head already about what this Hopf pairing gives, because we're going to instead focus on one implication of this Hopf pairing. So going forward, just a little bit here, is that we have a dictionary. And this dictionary is setting us up so that we can talk about OQSL2 co-modules, and that's the same thing as describing a UQSL2 module. So UQSL2 modules, okay, the representation theory of UQSL2 is well studied, well, well studied. People have been talking about this for a very long time. And we're going to be phrasing things in terms of OQSL2 co-modules. So it's nice that we have this nice dictionary that's given by that Hopf pairing. If you want to think of this, this is just like reversing arrows for if we have a co-module. So there's a co-action of OQSL2 on M, or we can flip things around and there's an action of UQSL2 on M. Okay. Uh, is there, does this uh, equivalence work uh, for, uh, is there any conditions on the module? Does it have to be like uh, integrable or anything or is it general? Are there any conditions on this? So if we have, a, so the, the condition, this is actually really coming from the Hopf pairing itself. So it's the fact that UQSL2 and OQSL2 are Hopf duals. So then, um, or, but okay, your question was, are there any conditions on that? No, I think we're fine. It's the pairing itself that's allowing us to just flip these arrows and everything like that. You can think of it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just like they're dual Hopf algebras is how you want to be thinking about this. Yeah, in your head, we have that. So now, okay. So now we have some preliminary topology set up and we have some preliminary algebra set up. And before, I, I think so, it was at 25 minutes. Is that when we take the break? Was that true? So I, I think that that's kind of, the setup was hoping to get through that preliminary information heading into the break. So I think that's great. a good place. So. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the recording for now. Recording Before. again. Yeah, go ahead. Is the co-module of UQSL2 will study as well? Oh, the co-modules of UQSL2, I would say are studied, but at least, I mean, I, I'll, I will, I guess, make the statement that in, from my perspective, it seems that the representation theory of UQSL2 is where the focus is usually on. So that's UQSL2 modules. There are certain people who have studied OQSL2 modules and the representation theory of, of just uh, even Hopf algebras in general and all these kinds of things. So it's not that they're not studied. It's just that I would argue that a heavy emphasis has been put on at least from the quantum topology perspective of the representations of UQSL2. I, I think there might be some kind of like, maybe they're equivalent or, or somehow related to each other because there's by some kind of Drenfeld double business or something. But 
this is sort of speculative, so maybe I'm wrong. Also, sorry if those terms don't mean anything to you, uh, but if they do, maybe that's helpful. Yeah. I, I, I am not exactly sure if, it, if, if, if I, if I see where that would come up with it, yeah. but it certainly could be a valuable technique. In um, actually, I, I also have a question for you. Uh, is there a way to like, just give it, maybe you're about to say this, to like give like an explicit algebra isomorphism between like U and O, or is it kind of awkward in this presentation? Oh, or is it not possible? An explicit algebra isomorphism. So I don't think, I, I, so I think what you, what you mean is uh, like an explicit isomorphism into the dual, or like an explicit isomorphism. Oh, maybe that is what I, yeah, maybe that is what I mean. So yeah, then then you, uh, you're saying that using the pairing, you can try to you can describe like yeah, the, okay. The yeah. But, okay. Yeah. That. Sorry. I. Yeah. Okay. That answers my question. And then you have to. I mean, since these aren't finite dimensional algebras, uh, dual, mm -hmm. you have to be a little bit careful where you're like okay, yeah, finite yeah, dual, yeah, yeah. dual, and that's exactly what this is and taking care of, and that's kind of what's been yeah. This way. yeah. Okay, I think there's a different thing in which you can think of UQSL2 as the algebra functions on a different group. And if you, but that's that's a different thing, so never mind. That would be, that'd be interesting. I'd be happy to talk about that though. Okay, uh, sounds like a great time to continue. Okay, so now we've kind of set up this preliminary algebra and preliminary topology, so we can start diving into the actual stated skein algebra, stated skein module, where we're going to be using that algebra and topology. And in your head, kind of going forward, your kind of like teaser of why you're interested is, where does the quantum group come into play? Like I spent this time developing OQSL2, so in your head you should be kind of waiting around to see how OQSL2 fits into this picture. But to start off, we don't necessarily just want three manifolds anymore. We have three manifolds together with a marking on the boundary. So we have these little marking intervals put onto the boundary of our three manifold. And instead of just looking at framed links inside of a three manifold, we'll be looking at framed tangles or framed just sub, uh, framed one submanifolds. And there's a slight um, compatibility condition to think about briefly where the framing should match up with the tangent line of, or the, the tangent of your marking interval, but that's it's not particularly important. It's easier to see if you think of it as a little thickened annulus, you want that thickened annulus to kind of fit into your marking on the boundary but it's not super important. And then we said stated skein algebra. So where is the state coming into play? It's nothing more than an assignment of plus or minus to these endpoints. Where our tangle meets the marking, we assign plus or minus. This is not related to an orientation or anything like that. We don't see any kind of like flow from minus to plus or anything like that. Just as the example given here, we have plus and plus. That's perfectly a fine thing to do. You're looking at all of the possible uh, assignments of plus and minus onto those endpoints. Okay. So before we had framed links in a three manifold, now we're going to want to look at stated tangles in a marked three manifold. And this is the stated skein module. So this piece up here is again, like we had before, kind of a wordy definition where you're just kind of throwing these words at it, but it's designed specifically to mimic that previous definition of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra. 
So you have a quotient of the free Laurent polynomial module generated by, instead of framed links, we have our stated tangles, our stated n tangles. But we have additional relations. So not only do we still have resolve a crossing and pop a bubble like we did in the ordinary skein algebra, because every framed link is an entangle. It just doesn't have any meetings with the boundaries. So we still take care of those in exactly the same way. That's what we mean by usual skein relations that was resolve the crossing and pop the bubble that we had before. But we have these additional relations on how to deal with the tangles that actually meet the boundary, these kind of arc-like tangles. And how we want to think about these, you can, you can think about it in two different ways. If we like the blackboard framing and definitely want to stick with that, then our framing sticking straight out of the screen at us means that our marking on the boundary looks like just a single dot because it's actually an interval coming straight out at us. So for example, this picture here denotes kind of hitting at the closer to you piece of that interval and coming back behind that. But that side view where now you're not looking straight down at it, but you see it lying kind of flat where this marking is like this, we see that this is just bounding a disk with your marking. If your arc kind of returns to the same marking, but it bounds a disk inside of there. Then that half bubble can be popped in this way, specifically when the markings are a plus over a minus. So these relations are very dependent on the type of states that you're putting on these endpoints. So if you have the same states on those two endpoints, that same situation where the arc returns but bounds a disk, okay, that's zero. That's just sent out of there. We don't even have to worry about that. But if you have a plus above a minus, you get this. And then instead of giving a relation for a minus above a plus, we have a height exchange relation, where if you have a minus above a plus like this, you can pull that down and over, change the ordering, kind of a height exchange move to pick up a factor of Q. So this might seem like it's a little bit out of left field on just introducing these relations for these stated arcs that are meeting those boundary markings. But again, as we said, we're kind of doing this with the hope that we'll be able to fit OQSL2 into this picture. So heading forward a little bit, but not quite there yet, that's still in the back of your head. A very important property of really skein algebras in general, but it's something that we really want to focus on, is the functoriality of stated skein algebras and really all skein algebras. This is a general property for skein algebras, is that if you have an embedding of a three manifold into another three manifold, and since we're in the stated case, we additionally have to embed the markings into the other markings, then we have a well-defined module map. So if I have some kind of stated tangle over here, I can just see where that is sent by the embedding. So of course this, uh, I mean, that maybe there should be like dashed lines or something, but there is this exact cylinder with two markings on it sitting inside of M prime over here on the right. This is kind of a key technique for studying this kind of object because it's going to allow you to work in smaller building block situations where you can compute things much more explicitly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this, the focus is you can look at this picture over here. It's much nicer, but it still is describing a lot of this tangle on the right. And this is a well-defined module map. If you don't have any markings, this is something that's just a general property about skein algebras. So embeddings, 
give well-defined module maps. Notice I haven't said anything about algebras here. It's just a module map for the moment. Okay. Well, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a question? Do there are modules uh, over which ring are they modules? Um, so these are modules right now. Um, we're just thinking about these if we go back up to our definition, right? As modules over Laurent polynomials in Q inverse. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Remember, we're taking like these formal linear combinations of stated tangles with our coefficients being these Laurent polynomials. And so that's kind of the ground, uh, the ground ring that we're working with. But you could argue that maybe we want to work more generally with some kind of commutative domain with an invertible Q inverse or Q to the one half. And, but for the moment, we'll, we're happy with Laurent polynomials. So now, marked surfaces and the skein algebras of marked surfaces are our next kind of jumping stone. And these were defined by Tang Lei in 2018. And we'll see that much of the work that uh, kind of I've actually done is joint work with Tang as well. So he originally introduced the skein, the stated skein algebra of a surface using the language of punctured bordered surfaces but we're gonna use marked surfaces because there's an equivalence between the two of them and it fits better with the three manifold picture. So this fits very similarly into the same framework as we saw with skein algebras of surfaces. When you took three manifolds in general, we didn't have as much structure as we did when it was a surface across, the, across an interval. Here, we have marked surfaces being, okay, we just have a surface with some marked points on the boundary, and we can cross that with an interval to give a three manifold. And then we can go back to this picture of stated skein modules that we just introduced before. Now, multiplication works in the same way as it did in the skein algebra picture. There's a notion of verticality and you're just stacking one diagram on top of the other, noting as well that this is well-defined on your boundary points, right? Oh, on these boundary points, because this is just coming straight out of the screen at you as an interval. So you can, even if they meet at the same boundary points, you can still stack one on top of the other in a well-defined way. And along with introducing the stated skein algebra picture specifically, rather than the stated skein module picture more generally, uh, Tang proved that there is a standard basis. So it's like the multi-curve basis of the original skein algebra, but you have to deal with kind of the ordering on the boundary where you have positive states above negative states only. And remember our height exchange relation is what will allow us to reorder those states on the boundary into a canonical way, quote unquote. So there's no negative states above positive states. And that gives a basis for this stated skein algebra. Okay. Now, here's the key thing. And it's taken a, a, like quite a bit of the talk to get here, but this isomorphism is kind of like the selling point of the field, I would say. I don't know if that's a necessarily a fair uh, assumption because there's a lot of different reasons people could be interested in something like this. But the stated skein algebra of the bygone, which is obviously a pretty simple thing to think about because it's the bygone topologically, that's not the most exciting object. But you have an isomorphism to OQ squared SL2. And this is a result of Costantino and Lay from uh, pretty recently. And this is where a lot of our structure heading forward is going to come from. Right? We spent this time thinking about OQSL2 before, and that's because the bygone, or the stated skein algebra of the bygone, is exactly OQSL2. And right here, I just have it written as an isomorphism of algebras, 
but this also preserves the co-product in the antipode, as we'll see in a second. And more than that, also the uh, co-R matrix, the braiding, the co-braiding that you have on OQSL2 as well. And all of these pieces, so is there a co-product co on the stated skein algebra? There is not, but that's, that's very close to where we're headed. So there's a co-product on the stated skein algebra of the bygone, specifically because you can split along an ideal arc. So there's a homomorphism that allows you to map from the uh, stated skein algebra to the stated skein algebra cut along an ideal arc. So just specifically to, I mean, uh, this is probably the picture I should have drawn before, but if you have the bygone and you split along that ideal arc, that maps by theta, say gamma, sure, to two disjoint copies of the bygone. So splitting the bygone down the middle gives you two bygones. And that's exactly the co-product on the stated skein algebra of the bygone. And that's exactly the co-product of OQSL2. So splitting along an ideal arc in the stated skein algebra sends, say, we might as well map this right here with like a plus plus. You look at the sum over x plus x x plus. So of, of course this that picture is much more apparent right here where we're just sending and uh, so we have an arc and we've split it. You're summing over the lifts of that arc. The possible states that could be put there plus or minus and we just sum over those two possibilities. And this actually gives you the exact formula for example like delta a is equal to a tensor a plus uh, B tensor C is exactly the co-product formula that you have for OQSL2 if you use that isomorphism. But uh, hope, hopefully that kind of addressed the question from the chat. Um, but there's a second half to that question. So not only do we have a co-product on the stated skein algebra of the bygone, but this structure specifically is designed so that splitting along an ideal arc like this gives that stated skein algebras of surfaces are OQ squared SL2 or pop or stated skein algebra of the bygone co-module algebras. Meaning it's an algebra, but also it's a co-module of OQSL2. And this co-action is really easy to describe. We have a marked point. There's an arc that splits off a bygone based off of it. So actually, for every marked point on your surface, you have a bi module action. So this is what we are looking to generalize with our time remaining. So for a surface, splitting along an ideal arc gave us that these were co-module algebras, but there's no algebra structure on stated skein modules of three manifolds. And all of this work is done specifically defining things on surfaces rather than using the three manifold picture that's kind of lurking in the background. So are there any questions about this co-module structure? Where does the red string go? So, oh yeah, so that is, right? This red strand there is kind of there, right? To there. That red strand is exactly what we cut along there. Or, oh, I see, I see, thanks. Is this, this, that wasn't a great picture, but I, hopefully it was informative enough to get you that the edge of the bygone is exactly what that's kind of when you split along, you're introducing the, the two markings there. But that, wasn't, that wasn't a great picture, but it sounds like it cleared things up a little bit. Okay. So what we were able to do is to generalize this picture a little bit. So instead of splitting along an ideal arc on a surface, 
you can actually split along any properly embedded disk in a marked three manifold. And it's very similar, right? It's very similar. So you're not doing anything much more complicated other than still sending any of these stated tangles to, a linear, to the sum over the lifts of those tangles. So for any properly embedded disk, it's going to behave pretty similarly to the case of surfaces. Now, there's, a cho there's of course a choice of an arc in that embedded disk, but it's not particularly important. It's just so that all of your tangles going through the disk kind of flatten and go through a nice well-defined place. But that's not particularly important. So we can split the stated skein modules of three manifolds along properly embedded disks. Something to point out is that if we go back up to this theorem, it's horrible practice to be scrolling back, but it's something I wanted to point out. This was an embedding. So in the case of surfaces, this is actually an injective algebra map. And that's, of course, a very nice property. For three manifolds, the picture is less clean and uh, the kernel is non-trivial, but um, it's intimately related to torsion in the skein modules of three manifolds. But that's a discussion for another, another time, but um, it was worth mentioning, I think. So now, the idea of a proof it's pretty simple. This is just a sketch. It's really hard to really go through the full details of any kind of proof, but maybe you can believe something like this, is that if we have a properly embedded disk, there's a collared neighborhood, and if we're careful, that looks an awful lot like the surface case, right? If we're careful, we can think of a collared neighborhood as a thickening of a surface, and then we can reduce back down to that work that was kind of already done. So not a great idea of the proof, but it's at least some kind of sketch to give you an idea that collared neighborhoods of say a disc, it's gonna allow us to kind of think locally as if this was a, the surface case because surface cross interval, disc cross interval, it's at least relatively believable. Okay. But this gives a coaction of OQSL2 or the skein module of the ball with two markings because that's just the bygone, right? The skein module of the bygone is the same thing as the skein algebra of the bygone in this context. It's just going to be a disk with two or a ball with two markings because that's the disk with two markings cross an interval. So we have a co-action, meaning that the stated skein module of the three manifold is in fact an OQSL2 co-module. And remember, that tells us that these are actual UQSL2 modules, which are something that's well studied, right? Remember the whole idea was this Hopf pairing, let us interchange those two uh, constructions. So OQSL2 co-action, UQSL2 action. But yeah, so now there's not much time remaining, but I did want to talk about one specific structural homomorphism that we were able to generalize and we won't be able to go through too many of the details of anything. But for OQSL2, we saw the classical coordinate algebra of OSL2, and then we saw the quantum one and there's a nice embedding of the classical case into the quantum case by raising things to the nth power if the order of Q is N. And an important observation is that the image of this is in the center. This is a central uh, sub Hopf algebra. So this is particularly nice. And with OQSL2 kind of serving as that additional information between skein algebras and stated skein algebras, it's kind of natural to think, how can this fit into the picture of skein algebras? 
And that was a wordy way of saying very little. But um, I do want to, so we have threading. And this is uh, a key idea that uses that functoriality that we talked about before, was that for any kind of, um, any kind of uh, stated arc here, we can look at a threaded power of that arc, which is different from the algebra power. So we see that if that arc was an annulus, then this is kind of, uh, with that sticking straight up, we're looking at the threaded power of that arc, meaning that in that little annulus, this is just multiplication in the core. But when we put that annulus into the three manifold, that's not the same thing as actually just multiplying the arc multiple times. This is maybe a technical detail that's not providing that much insight, but it's relatively, it's kind of an important little distinction here. So now the Chebyshev homomorphism, and this is for the Kaufman bracket skein algebra, and this is uh, kind of going back to that classical information, was at roots of unity. And there's some things being swept under the rug about, okay, for OQSL2, there was this integral version of the quantum group at roots of unity that we kind of needed there. But for Kaufman bracket skein algebras, we don't need to worry about the quantum group side of things. And you can just dive right in. And you can look at an embedding of the quasi-classical skein algebra into the skein algebra at a root of unity. And this Chebyshev threading map has been instrumental in understanding the kind of representation theory and really the structure of Kaufman bracket skein algebras of uh, surfaces that don't have markings. That doesn't necessarily mean a closed surface. You can still have punctures and things like that, but no markings in the sense of a marked surface or stated skein algebra. So now, and this is, uh, of course, we've sped through here at the end a little bit, but kind of the key like result is that this can be extended from the Chebyshev homomorphism of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra to a Chebyshev Frobenius homomorphism of stated skein modules of three manifolds. And you still send framed links to their threading by the Chebyshev polynomials, so that behaves in the exact same way. But how do you deal with arcs? Well, you send them to their framed nth power, kind of mimicking that Frobenius homomorphism from OSL2 into OQSL2. And something that's worth mentioning as well is that this uh, Frobenius homomorphism commutes with the splitting homomorphism along a properly embedded disk. And that can be a really helpful kind of thing. And I think that with one minute left, rather, I mean, uh, the kind of talking about the idea of the proof is really just using functoriality. So take building blocks where you have a simpler picture, understand everything in that simpler picture, and then map it into your three manifold. So building block computations allow you to make claims in the three manifold in general. But I think that puts me uh, out of time. So I think that's kind of a good place to stop here. Um, yeah. Thank you, Wade. All right. Um, are there any questions for Wade? Um, with uh, you, you mentioned that the uh, status scan algebra of the bygone is isomorphic to this OQ. Uh, I, I'm in the process of learning also, but this is, uh, so o OQ has this uh, crystal basis in, in, in it, and Tung Lee talks about that in the paper. Does the like more general stated scan algebras, do, do they have some sort of structure like that related to this crystal basis? It's a fantastic question, right? So uh, I think dual to that question is the like understanding the canonical base, like Lustig's canonical bases for representations of UQSL2, for example, and then trying to ask the question of, okay, so dual to that, you have these crystal bases like Kashiwara crystal bases, 
Um, and then how does that really relate to stated scan algebras of the bygone? So then I guess the question is, how is that basis related to the first I, I don't know the answer. Fantastic question. It is the shortest way to, to yeah, say that. I think a, a great open area of questioning. Even just giving right, uh, ha having any kind of method that allows for explicit combinatorial constructions of crystals is very valuable, right? Like, so if you could use stated skein algebras to try to describe the structure of crystal bases for, uh, I'm not sure if they're, I don't, I don't have a great answer, but I think it's a great question. How should we, how should I think about the states? Mm. Could be so, a weird question, but the definition doesn't seem natural to me. Oh, I should say it seems very clever to me. Yes, right. So uh, really, you want to be thinking about the states as the basis vectors for the two-dimensional representation of, of uh, UQSL2 or OQSL2, whatever the that homework. makes sense suddenly, yes. And so that's uh, there's current there's tons of work currently on extending that to say like SLN scan algebras, and then that that's kind of the natural choice of labelings on the boundaries. That's what allows you to show that this is actually like a lift of the Rashidi contrived invariant. This is a lift of Rashidi contrived invariant. Yeah, Could right. So, please say something more about this. Yeah. So, if you look at so even like, so this was the stated scan algebra of the bygone. And so that's fantastic. But what about the other like really small surfaces and things? So, there you can talk about like the stated scan algebra of the monogon, right? And so, then you're, um, so yeah. So, if you look at a monogon, right? and then you want to cut along the arc kind of connecting back to itself, you're going to get a bygone on one side, but then also a second copy of the monogon. So you have this co-action there. So then you have an action. That, so describing that action is, is kind of what I meant there because evaluating everything in the monogon is going to come down to a constant. But... I see. When you say lift is there any chance you mean something like is this like the the like one dimensional or like co-dimension two part is how you use is that why the states come in because it's like the the one part of like it has a three two one thing or is that not the right extension i don't think so but that doesn't okay. necessarily mean that there isn't it's a not okay there, there could be a way okay. to interpret that in that way, but I'm not, okay. not directly is how I'll answer the question. Okay, okay, thanks. So, so, so the relations for the stated scan algebra is those are, uh, you can see them as taken from the representation theory of UQ SL2. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. Um, also, one more question, if that's okay. Uh, so, so you, you were saying that the status gain modules have this o OQ co-module structure, and then you can transfer it to this UQ uh, module structure. Do, does that, mo uh, as a UQ module, does that have, like, uh, the nice properties that we kind of learn about? Uh, like your uh, highest asking, weight and stuff. If you're asking if you can decompose it into like a direct sum of the nice integrable UQ SL2, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, so at least in the case of surfaces, that's done like explicitly in uh, co the Constantino Lay paper. And a very similar thing works for th three manifolds, but uh, that's the explicit details of that. I don't uh, actually know. Uh, but the, the, same, the same idea for how you can decompose the co-module algebra. So as a co-module algebra, it is a co-module. And they describe explicitly the decomposition of 
that UQSL2 module into it as you're, as you're asking about it. Okay, thank you, thank you. So in this example, can you see the relations in OQ explicitly? Like, how do you see, I don't know, AG minus QBC or something like this? So um, I do appreciate that you gave the hardest relation, but, or the quantum. I mean, you can take the easier one and explain like why them. Yeah, like that. yeah, so that's the, the, so if we, oh, right. So if you want to look at one of, or so yeah, so you look at this right here and then you look at something like this plus plus and then you look at something like this, which is maybe um, we might as well choose, all right, plus minus, right? Mm -hmm. so this here, if we have this orientation, is A, B, right? Mm -hmm. So now if we go back up, if we just scroll up a little bit and we look at like our height exchange relation, then this is going to be the starting point of how we can pull that. Sorry. Are, are you drawing your picture in a side view or in the top view? Because I was confused by this point. Um, this is the side view. Yeah, this is the side view. If you want, you could just draw. You could draw. So, so the actual three manifold is this thing across an interval? Yes. And the arc is in a... Uh, arc is horizontal, I guess. So the arcs are horizontal and not vertical. I would have. The arcs are the arcs are horizontal across like that. Yeah, they're connecting the two different markings. Mm -hmm. But still, so I miss uh, like how do you exchange these two lines exactly? So yeah, the height exchange relation is going to allow you to take a minus above a plus. So if we just do something like this, right, uh, plus plus, and then the height exchange relation is going to let us go to Q times. Uh, this, right? Mm -hmm. But now, um, now, this is, so this was a plus up here, this was a plus, this was a plus, and this was a plus? Oh, no, this was a minus. minus. Yeah. Yeah, the last one is minus. Mm -hmm. So now you might say, well, how do we reduce down? But if we just resolve the crossing using the resolution, the crossing, re the resolve a crossing relation, mm -hmm. Well, to Q squared times this, right? And you might say, isn't it a sum of two things? But in the second term of the sum, you have a turn back where you've hit two pluses. Mm -hmm. And that is zero. So that entire diagram, that entire, entire term is just killed in a sense of zero. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I think it's much more clear. Than, you know? So this is uh, so this is a b. Uh, oh wait, I changed. I changed mid conversation there. Right. This is b a. Q squared, a b. Mm -hmm. And so a priori you will get the second term, but it dies because of this term back relation. And you can rephrase the relation in a slightly different way that is a little bit more explicit, but it depends on if you prefer height exchange moves or height exchange moves and you resolve the crossing because you could, you could rewrite that relation as also applying the resolution and then you just have a sum of two terms. Mm -hmm. And so what about AG minus BC? There's a, there's a little bit more work, right? Because it's like a two- But that, that sounds kind of skin relation. So you're saying that basically AB, like from this argument, AB is like one of the crossings? Uh, AB is like one of the- Like this diagram with the red thing. Yeah, yeah, right. Because you can always, you could, because our canonical mm -hmm. basis in the sense of like the, that standard basis was you want all of your positive terms to be above your, all of your positive states to be above negative states on the mm -hmm. ordering of the diagram. So yeah, you could think of it as this being a crossing there. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's using that relation that allows you to say that the positive states above the negative states is part of that basis. So it might be a little circular there on is the resolution or the basis kind of way to do it. Uh, 
sorry, and maybe the last question. So in this diagram, so is it obvious that like I can draw in principle any horizontal braid, right? Yeah. So pick like a bunch of signs on the left, a bunch of signs on the right and connect them by any braid, which is horizontal mm -hmm. here. So like part of the theorem says that uh, you can resolve anything by some kind of normally ordered monomials in ABCD. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's, so that's a good point. So you're saying take any basis and kind of send that over. Well, resolve all, if you wanted to do it in like a hand wavy, but maybe like, so it's not actually going to be super precise, but if you have a braid, just resolve all the crossings. Now you have a non-crossing planar or a sum of non-crossing planar matchings, and you're going to just get horizontal um, arcs and things that return to the same side, but we have relations that deal with things that like cups and caps that return to the same side. So then it's going to resolve to some linear combination of horizontal arcs. No, I, because like normally you would expect something like temper Lieb algebra showing up here, right? Because you have like all this turn back, but you're saying that you can ignore all these caps and caps. Right, because we have these relations uh, here, right? So if we had any turn backs or like the cups and caps, uh -huh. then it makes life a lot easier by introducing by having those relations of returning arcs. Mm -hmm. So in the bygone, there's no need to worry about any topological thing coming up. So any returning arc bounds a disk, and then you can apply these relations to reduce down. Yeah, thanks. That's super helpful. Uh, yeah, so I, I have a, a question that may be kind of ill-formed, so I apologize in advance. Um, so if I have, let's say I have a braid diagram drawn in the diagon, um, then, so it's unstated, but it, you know, there's some, you look at, um, so you can, you can view that braid as either determining an element in the sort of usual Kaufman skein, or you look at the sort of collection of things that represents in the stated Kaufman's game. So there's like two to some power possible ways of assigning states to either end. So maybe part one of my question is, are you saying the collection of all possible, um, okay, maybe my question is, I can also get, I can also view that braid as being like a morphism of UQSL2 representations and I can look at the standard basis of the you know, domain and the codomain. And so I get also like a bunch of matrix coefficients. So the indexing set in both is the same. So like the ways of placing, assigning states to the braid diagram, there's two to some power of those. And the matrix number of matrix coefficients is also the same indexed by the same thing. What's the relationship? Are you saying that there's some like trace or some kind of evaluation from OQSL2 to like numbers? Uh, that, like, yeah. how are the matrix coefficients in my right. Russian zenith derived invariance of the braid related to? That's the co-unit. And you just apply co-unit to one to get the other co-unit. Yeah, and that, so I think what you're describing, and there's, I think, uh, there's a flip on maybe the picture that you described versus what I will say, which is, I think you're describing that the co-R matrix on OQSL2 is exactly the co-unit, right? Or the co-unit applied to the co-R matrix is giving those coefficients. Okay, thank you. That's the picture of, I guess, where do I have some, some white space to, to draw things? Mm -hmm. so if we have, um, yeah, it, well, it, oh. it's really important. But the, the, the idea is, yeah, that crossing that you're introducing from a braid is exactly the, uh, the entry of the co-R matrix. Mm -hmm. And you apply the co-unit to that diagram. So there's a nice geometric picture of the co-braiding would be how I would describe what you asked, I think. Mm -hmm. Where you just that it is just the crossing. It is just the and so any braid is then just going to be built out of pieces of that co-unit applied to co-braiding. Okay, thank you. Um I might have more questions, but I need to think. So if you don't have a bygone, if you have like a triangle or a polygon, uh, do you get something like tensor powers of your OQ? Yeah, right. So the triangle and actually in general, gluing along a triangle for two stated skein algebras of surfaces gives a braided tensor product 
of the skein algebra of the stated skein algebras of the component surfaces. So for a triangle, you are gluing two bigons along a triangle, which is a silly way of thinking about it, but it gives you that the stated skein algebra of the triangle is the braided tensor product of OQSL2 with itself. And of course, uh, like the splittings that we described and the Frobenius homomorphism, uh, it preserves the co-braiding as was just described there. So it factors through that uh, braided tensor product. But in particular, you're saying that bygone is much more fundamental for this discussion than triangle. It's I would, like, yeah, I think the earlier work of uh, Tank led says that like you triangulated surface and then you have the state of skin algebra, but like, that's already dealing with the double of OQ in some sense. So yeah, you have that, just a single OQ. Giving an ideal triangulation of the surface, you can just split along all of the edges of your triangulation and you embed into some tensor power of triangles, right? That's what the, the injectivity of the splitting map tells us that, okay, given any surface with an ideal triangulation, you can embed into the tensor product of a bunch of triangles. But each of those triangles is described as the braided tensor product of two copies of OQSL2. Mm -hmm. So bygone in some sense is more fundamental. Yeah, I would triangle. Sure. Maybe it's your perspective though. I don't know. I mean, it's just easier for me to think about the basis in OQSL2 rather than the basis in OQ tensor OQ. But yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I'm going to pause the recording now, but um, afterwards, feel free to keep going.